So one of the most important decisions we as musicians need to make when we play music, but certainly when we play music that has been composed a long time ago, let's say music from Bach, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, Chopin, Schumann, you name it, is the tempo in which we are going to play that composition. Regardless of any reconstruction of historical tempi, your tempi will decide the character of the piece, the articulation, the phrasing, accentuation, and every other aspect of a performance you can think about. So, and if you would like, if you are actually eager to reconstruct the original idea that the composer had in mind, the 10 seconds before Beethoven started to write his fifth symphony, that I would say that first premiere performance of the piece, then reconstructing the original tempi are really key in understanding that. Since again, tempo changes, changing tempo changes everything. So when you want to reconstruct that original idea, there is no escape from trying at least to reconstruct those original tempo indications. And of course, on this channel, we talk a lot about metronome numbers. And metronome numbers are great and often skipped today. But they are great because they represent the accurate, exact tempo indication that those composers actually had in mind. So just take your metronome, apply the metronome mark, just let the device stick and in a few seconds you sort of reach hand to the original composer, at least to his idea of, his, of the tempo indication. But below this level of metronome marks, you have the kind of foundational layer of notation. So we tend to forget today that in the 18th century, certainly also early 19th century, and basically, basically throughout the 19th century, where things get a little bit complicated, we're going to talk about that in a minute, that there was a kind of convention about what the natural movement or the natural tempo, the so-called tempo ordinario, was for certain time signatures. Now, in Beethoven's time, this gets a little bit more complicated, hence the invention of time indicators like the metronome. A small quote from a letter of Beethoven, 1826. So that's the very end of his life. And it also shows that Beethoven, as many other composers, were really happy with the metronome. Oftentimes you will read that people say Beethoven despised the metronome. It's based on one quote basically given by Schindler, which might be true, but it was a kind of frustrated moment in which he said, well, why give him metronome marks if no one cares about them? It was even in Beethoven's time, certainly at the end of his life, that musicians were actually caught by this kind of virus of virtuosity. And the older generation of musicians didn't like that because it was changing their music and the music of the past in a way they have never seen before. But it doesn't mean that Beethoven didn't care about the metronome. He kept on giving metronome marks his entire life. And here's a letter of 1826, very interesting, interestingly talking also on the tempo ordinario. So I just quote from Letters of Beethoven. It's a very interesting edition if you want to have the letters of Beethoven and just search for Emily Anderson. You might be lucky to find it not so expensive. So he writes in December 18, 1826 to Bernard Schott in Mainz. He says, the metronome markings will be sent to you very soon. Do wait for them. In our century, such indications are certainly necessary. Moreover, I have received letters from Berlin informing me that the first performance of the symphony was received with enthusiastic applause, which I ascribe largely to the metronome markings. We can scarcely have tempi ordinario, or tempi ordinari, in fact he writes, any longer, since one must fall into line with the ideas of unfettered genius. What he actually says is that the distance between 
the tempo ordinario related to a certain notation, certainly in this time, in the 20s, you will see scores that are fairly complicated. Hence the wish and the call for devices that actually could give time. So the tact messer, the metronome, and the, uh, the metronome actually, but also many pendulums were invented, so to say, and promoted in that time. Now, that doesn't mean that notation is or needs to be always a mystery. Certainly in pieces that are still written in the 18th century and early 19th century, oftentimes you will have still very clear um, indications of what the true tempo, so the tempo giusto or the tempo ordinario, is not really the same thing, meant. And in this first symphony that I've been recording now, that's actually a very good example to show you some things. So. If we go to the first movement, and about the Adagio I will say something at the end, but let's now focus on the Allegro con Brio. There you will see that Beethoven notes this down in a C and an alla breve sign. One of the most misunderstood relationships perhaps, and even on a high academic level, that common time versus alla breve is just two times as fast. And this essentially is true. I've made a video on that that you might want to check out if you haven't seen that. So basically, the relationship between common time and alla breve time is really a tempo indication or tempo choice that's, that's two times faster. Alla breve goes two times faster as common time. You oftentimes will see common time related to in single beat, quarter note 60, so the second, and the alla breve, <coughs> excuse me, in half note 60. So that would be indicated in whole beat as 120 and this as half note 60. So then the ticks of the metronome give the binary division of the metronome mark. But that's only true. There's something that's oftentimes missing in this information. That's only true when the notation of the alla breve is the old one, which means that you, will, that you are actually doubling tempo but halving the note value. So in common time, you will see that 16 notes are the fastest used structural note values. And harmony changes, you will have a normal harmonic change pattern, which is two, two per bar, I would say. Of course, this is not a very strict guide, but you will very quickly see that if you are looking for it that the piece written in the normal common time is actually restricting itself to 16th notes and two harmony changes per bar. Whereas in the alla breve, the restriction is eighth note and one harmony change per bar. Why this double use? Common time leans more to a more articulated, more brilliantes spiel than the alla breve, where the not notation actually leans towards performance that is more legato, a little bit heavier. So the character of the two movements or the time signatures really uh, differs a lot. Now, if we're going to look at the symphony number one, then we see that Beethoven uses the alla breve sign, but he's using 16th notes, he's using also triplets. So, and he is using sometimes just one harmony change per bar, sometimes two harmony changes per bar, but sometimes even more. But this is actually a strong indicator because they were really aware that when they use the alla breve sign in combination with these note values that they were not writing in a tempo that was double as fast as common time, but in a tempo that was somewhere in between here. And in fact, if you read some 18th century French sources, this relationship you will find often. For instance, Hotter is describing this very clear and very practical common time. He calls the alla breve just the two sign, doubling tempo, halving note values, and something in between. In the French literature, you will find this notation in between. So alla breve sign with the use of 16th notes, often as described as mesure à quatre temps vite. So it's a time signature, it's a tempo um, in, with four fast counts. So not the two very slow ones in the alla breve. So typically in, in, in 
the tempo indication is somewhere between 60, that's whole beat, and obviously 120. If we then go here to see what Beethoven's own tempo indication was, we see that he is actually here, 112. So indeed that's somewhere between common time and um, alle breve time. So this means 112 for the quarter notes. Again, the metronome ticks in that tradition or gives the subdivision of the note to come to a periodic unity to define that note value. Anyway, there is a video also introducing you on that. But 112, it's an interesting number. It falls in between this and the, the Italian tempo word is Allegro con Brio. So imagine that he wouldn't have written Allegro con Brio, then this would be just the tempo ordinario for that piece. And in fact, also that you can read in Hotete, this would fall right in the middle around 1996. So, 96 increasing the tempo a little bit thanks to the allegro and certainly the combrio which doesn't mean the same as allegro assai by the way it's often confused combrio means um, with bravery actually as a kind of heroic tempo indication so then you see that this number increases the 96 to 112 but 112 here is actually not an alle breve, but a mesure a quatre ton vite, but a rather fast one. Basically, it's very simple, I recapitulate. So, common time, 16th notes, two harmony changes per bar. Just take this as a secondary thought. Just focus on the, on the note values. Alle breve, only eight note values. Use of the alle breve sign, with the use of the sixth of 16th notes, or even faster, decreases the tempo. Concerning the adagio molto, adagios and andantes are more complicated than just allegros and certainly allegros like we have been talking about now on the first symphony. The reason is that we kind of lost that tradition really of going in the direction of adagio and largo. You have an interesting source which is Benjamin Carr, just look it up and I will make a video. It's 1826 and he gives a very interesting tempo relationship between um, what he calls the middle tempo allegretto and by the way allegretto is a middle tempo you will oftentimes for instance Hummel I think uh, describes the middle tempo as allegro moderato or just moderato those things are related to this kind of um, tempo ordinario thing and he says well half of that you will have the adagio tempo sorry for my handwriting here and to the prestissimo it's times two and he gives clearly the allegretto as 60 or actually as a second which is out of discussion so 60 quarter note single beat that would be 60 half note so if we apply that to our to our uh, notation understanding that that the normal tempo is divided by two then you would end in a tempo of 60 for the quarter note and whole beat which is actually 60 for the eighth note beethoven gives in whole beat 88. So translated in single beat, this would be 8 note 44. That's a great thing about having these metronome numbers because if we wouldn't have this metronome of 88, it would be harder to reconstruct that original tempo because the relationship between the tempo ordinario going a little bit up for the allegro, a little bit down for the andante, you come in, a, in an area where tempi became slower in a sense that you start to count in eighth notes or even in sixteenth notes as Czerny also describes in his pianoforte school. So certainly for the reconstruction of the andanti and the adagios tem tempi the metronome numbers are golden information. But anyway for this first part of the symphony and actually for the whole symphony we will make some other videos on the notation. It's composed 1799-1800. 
true principles, I would say, for the notation relationship with the tempo ordinario still apply. And it's very interesting and very um, fundamental, actually, to learn to understand those. I plan to make in the future more videos like this, since talking about the metronome numbers is one thing, relating them to the tempo ordinario is another thing and a very interesting thing, because that's one of the strongest proofs, so to say, also for the existence of the whole beat. Um, performance practice of the metronome reading, since the tempo ordinario, for instance, by Czerny is uh, double as fast as being described in seconds. So that's really interesting. So if the tempo ordinario just has a closer, is described as a second, that single beat for Czerny, surprisingly, this is 120. And for Hummel as well, and for Moschus as well, and, and all the others as well. So the tempo ordinario and understanding that is a strong proof, again, for the whole beat metronome practice existence. I hope you liked this technical video. Let me know in the comment section if you would like to have more of these kind of in-depth talks on notation and tempo relationships. And I will be happy to do that because that's one of the things that is for me most fascinating to do, relate those metronome marks to the notation and see how they relate. So that was it for today. Give this video certainly a thumbs up if you like it. YouTube wants you to do that with, his, with their new algorithm changes. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel and you want to, don't want to miss anything, subscribe to it. I would be very happy to receive you here or to, to have you as a member of this authentic sound community. But also hit the bell icon and set your notifications for this channel because YouTube is not sending you notifications if you don't. And it would be pity if you would miss future updates, isn't it? And last but not least, thank for my patrons because they support the things we are doing so much. And if you would become also part of this inside member group on Patreon, there is a link below. And by doing that, you will not only receive um, extra information, I would say, and actual things that I share there, but also support the things we are doing. Thank you so much for even considering this. And for now, hope to see you next time again.